Well, good afternoon from sunny Bristol, um, from the University of West of England Centre for Print Research. Uh, welcome to um, the, our 14th uh, lunchtime seminar. And um, well, I'm delighted to welcome uh, our own Xavi Ore and Thomas Bale uh, to the stage in a moment. And uh, the two of them will, will present their work, um, that uh, their recent work on the development of an automated image-based 3D scanner system, which is recording the structure and color of planar surfaces of, of artworks. Um, this is... Um, and Javi in particular has, has worked at the CRPR for a little while and um, he's gonna, we're both going to show the scanner and results of the recording of the Grand Canal Ascension Day by Canaletto. So without any further ado, let me just uh, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we have got a chat uh, function on the right hand side and you can also add some questions and answers there if you like uh, for, uh, for after the talk. Um, with the, the session is recorded, so you're welcome to uh, look back at all our recordings uh, on the CFPR cfpr.ue.ac.uk website. And um, yes, please feel free to contribute later in the chat. So over to you, Xavi and Thomas, please. All right. Um, so. Um, today's presentation uh, will we'll sort of provide an overview of, of the scanning system. Some of you already know it because you've seen it uh, before, um, which is basically a scanner that uh, we have been developing at CFPR uh, for the last uh, couple of years. And its uh, main purpose is to scan uh, planar surfaces uh, such as uh, paintings. Um, as a case study, we'll use a painting by uh, Italian artist Canaletto. And then um, at the second part of the presentation, Thomas uh, will will focus on sort of his approach that he developed um, to to process multi-view um, surface data. Um, just to say that this work was uh, carried out as part of UWI's uh, Vice Chancellor Early Career Development Awards, and is also uh, it's been an ongoing collaboration with uh, Kyle and and Chad from Bashtu, who run a technology company working uh, in the arts and, and, and robotics. Um, just to introduce, um, so we'll, we'll start with the introduction of the painting and then we'll move on to uh, explain the, the scanner and the software that runs it. Um, then I'll show you how the sort of, uh, we scan the painting, how the, uh, the, the data is processed overall, just a sort of a short explanation. And then uh, as well, a presentation of the sort of outputs, and then we'll move on to Thomas with the processing of the surface normal data. Um, so this is the painting. Um, and we had a chance to scan it um, last year. Um, it was uh, undergoing uh, conservation treatment or restoration in, in uh, Bristol uh, based studio IFEX. Um, and it was, basically being restored just before an exhibition that uh, in Bath at the Holver Museum last year. So we had a chance to go and scan it just right after the, the restoration was finished. Um, the painting is by Canaletto and of course it's, it's a view of Venice. In this case, uh, it represents um, the festivity of the Ascension Day, which is sort of symbolizes the marriage of the city with, with, the, with the sea. Um, the painting, as you see, it's, uh, it's quite a large painting, which was sort of very good to test our, our scanner. So it's almost two meters by 120 centimeters. Um, yeah, and it's usually uh, housed at the Warburg Navy collection, um, which they have a massive collection uh, of, of kind of letters. Um, so this is the scanner. Um, so the scanner is designed to, to capture uh, color and, and the structure of, of planar surfaces. And its design is supposed to be affordable and simple and just using a, a camera. So it's image based. Uh, in this case, we use a Sony camera, um, which is then coupled to uh, linear guides, which are about a meter square. So we are able to scan about a meter square. But the scanner, we can, as you see, it has it's, it's supported on, on, on linear rails, so we can scan, like in the case of Canaletto, 
you can scan multiple sections both in 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 sort of height and 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 width um, the scanner then has 24 leds on the different spokes there's three uh, three leds on each spoke and they're extendable so if we uh, need to scan larger areas with a larger field of view we can extend the arms so the lights are sort of farther away from the center of of, of the image um yeah so the scanner uses two techniques uh one is photogrammetry um some of you might know if you don't it's basically a technique to produce 3d data using uh, multiple images that you photograph in sort of quite a large overlap in the case of Canaletto, it was about 70 percent overlap um and as you see on the sort of diagram you take pictures sort of in in following a sort of order um until you basically record the whole surface uh, it usually you take it with diffuse lighting sort of even lighting trying to avoid any sort of uh, hard shadows and the other technique is uh in the cultural heritage is called as uh, reflectance uh, transformation imaging um, in machine vision it's more known as sort of photomatic stereo and this one consists of photographing uh, sort of the same area but with with different light positions so as you see in the diagram in 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 this case instead of having as many images as, as in photogrammetry we would photograph less sections with about you know 10 to 30 percent overlap but then each section is photographed uh in our case uh 24 times so with the 24 leds so the main outputs um of photogrammetry uh, are uh, point clouds which are basically um, 3d points in space that represent the surface that, that you're scanning and then that point cloud you can export as as a mesh which is the use sort of more usual format to export 3d data um, the main outputs of, uh, of uh, RTI or photometric stereo are the sort of surface surface normal maps, and these are usually um, represented as 2D images, and and these images contain uh, information per pixel of the direction of the surface at that point. Um, it has this blue color because the X, Y, Z coordinates of that vector are represented in RGB colors. Um, so it has this sort of funny blue color. Um, and then these kind of images um, are able um, allow us to render them in 3D software. And the, soft and the software, in combination with sort of when you set up your scene, you can add the lighting and the cameras, and that combination allows you to render sort of that fine detail. Um, so in the case of our painting, that that uh, small section that you see there uh, on the diagram, that would be one section of the painting. But then we have taken, in this case, more than 100 uh, different sections of the Canaletto painting, which are then stitched together. Um, the stitching, which is something that um, um, Thomas will discuss, that uh, needs calibration, um, because there are some, some errors that are happening there. Um, but sort of the end goal is that we can create a whole uh, image with the surface data information uh, from the multiple sections. And then this surface data as image can be mapped to our 3D model. So as you see in the diagram on top, uh, we have sort of the polygonal mesh. And you can see that basically it has three directions of normals. But then once you map this sort of normal map on top of the mesh, you obtain a much finer detail and is this sort of information that allows us to provide uh, such such good data um just a comparison um so to show you the different techniques so you have the color section that's about nine centimeters square um the middle images is the sort of rti data or photometric stereo and compared to the uh, right image which is the photogrammetry you can see there's a slight, even though the photogrammetry is surprisingly good, there's still much more sort of information that you can um, recover with 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 uh, PS. Just another example. Uh, you can see a little bit in the center of the image. There's sort of the the, the canvas texture that sort of shows that doesn't show as much in the photogrammetry. And another one. It's just slightly better. 
uh, relief that we can then merge together. Um, right, so this is the software. Uh, it is currently in, in development. And the idea is uh, right now it only works with our camera, which is a Sony. So the idea is that we can integrate it with other sort of major brands uh, such as Canon and Nikon. Um, so our colleagues, uh, Kyle and Chad, are working on the sort of software update at the moment. Uh, but basically what you see here is um, um, the main GUI uh, where you sort of input sort of the field of view of the camera, the area that you want to scan, and then you can control the camera, the parameters of the camera, um, and then the, the amount of overlap that you need. So you set the overlap for the photogrammetry and you set the overlap for the RTI. And then we can also control the, the power of the LEDs. So depending on how dark uh, the surface is or, or, or if it's lighter, then we can control the amount of light. Um, so on the right image, you can see sort of uh, a section that's been sort of just scanned. So after you input all the parameters, then it shows uh, um, automatically the number of images with the right overlap, the blue square, that would be your field of view. Um, so once you sort of selected all the parameters, you just press star and it automatically records everything. Um, yeah. um, just a quick overview of how the scanning uh, was done. Um, so Canaletto, as I said, was quite large. So we needed uh, six sections to scan it. Uh, you can see on the diagram on top, um, two full sections and then smaller ones. Um, so that was fairly easy just measuring because I, I know exactly how much I can scan. Then you just move it basically another meter and with the right overlap, um, there was no issues there. Um, and then the images below uh, show uh, the the second one, that's the uh, custom sort of calibration board that uh, Thomas used as well for calibrating uh, the surface data. And that's quite useful because we have a reference uh, of height and a reference of sort of a plane. That's very useful then for Thomas to, to calibrate his data. Um, the billiard ball that you see there, that's the uh, how we calibrate the lights. So basically the LEDs reflect um, on the billiard bolt, and then we can extract the position of the of the LEDs um, as they are reflected on the ball. Um, we don't have to do the calibration uh, every time. It's only if if you change the sort of the, the distance from from to the painting, then you have to recalibrate the lights. Uh, so for this painting, for example, we just calibrated at the at the beginning, and because we maintain the same distance, then we can reuse the same calibration of lights. Um, that's another two images. So here you can see that's uh, sort of a screenshot from the uh, photogrammetry software, where you can see all the positions of all the all the all the camera positions. Um, these white dots would be uh, photogrammetry, and the red ones are the photometric stereo images. So obviously, it's less less images for photometric stereo, but just. Uh, a reminder that each dot contains 24 images. So in the end, you end up pretty much with the same amount of images for each technique. Uh, in this case, it was about almost sort of 5,000 images in total. Um, this looks scary, but uh, it's. I'll just go over it uh, fairly quickly. So uh, when I process the data, so I have the two different data sets. I usually start with the photometric stereo data set. And I, I, I use each each stack for each section. I extract the uh, color information by averaging the 24 images. And basically that gives me a very nice sort of uh, color image without any shadows or specular highlights. And I use those images then, uh, I add those images to the photogrammetry set. Um, and then I process both sets together um, with the photogrammetry software. In this case, I use a software called Agisoft Metashape. Um, there's other softwares you could use. Uh, I found this quite sort of uh, easy. And in some occasions, it's actually able to, to extract more detail than, than other software I tested. Um, so then with, with, with Agisoft, you are able to uh, 
generate sort of different different outputs. Uh, we can produce sort of digital elevation models or DEMs. I will show you in the next slide what they are. Uh, or thomosaics, which are sort of very large images, uh, as you would see from up some in front of the painting. So, like uh, if you're looking uh, perpendicularly to the painting, then you can generate. Uh, you know, when you sort of merge all the images together, you end up with a massive sort of gigapixel image. Uh, it can be in color, but the ortho mosaic uh, um, can also be with the surface data information. So once uh, we process the photometric stereo images uh, with the uh, with the you know that's the calibration that Thomas does, we can exchange the color images that we had from photometric stereo with the um, normal map images. We can just switch them and then instead of creating a color ortho mosaic, we can create a, a surface data ortho mosaic. So we obtain a high resolution color image and we obtain a high resolution surface data image. Um, and finally, obviously you can export uh, sort of 3D models, 3D meshes. Um, Again, with the same with the color and the and the uh, surface data information. And briefly, so these are sort of just to give you a visual sort of uh, idea of what they are. The digital elevation model. So these are usually uh, uh, raster images that represent uh, um, surface information. You you can think of it uh, as as sort of a Google Maps information type of thing, uh, where it, it will give you the height. Uh, at per pixel level as well. Um, and these are very useful uh, because we can use the same technique as they use uh, sort of with satellite imagery, but with painting. So we can extract, as you see at the bottom image, um, the measure of the actual impasto of the paint. Uh, so we can run sort of a, a line across and that will give you a nice graph with the whole impasto um, heights which is quite useful for conservation purposes um, and to record the actual condition of the painting. Um, the ortho mosaics, uh, so they are very large images that you can see the ones I produced for Canaletto are you know, almost 70,000 pixels by 44,000 pixels. Um, we, we will show you this uh, later on. Um, and as I said, we have this bluish one, which is the surface data, and then we have the color one. Um, the nice thing about it is that they are completely registered. Um, so we can have them overlap and switch between them as you will see uh, later on. And, and that's extremely useful for sort of viewing the data uh, simultaneously. And the 3D model. So that's uh, a 3D model. Uh, obviously it has to be uh, in a much sort of lower resolution than the actual sort of uh, raw data because if you want to, for example, share this online, you'll have to reduce the size of, of the actual mesh and the size of, of your images. Um, and this is something we're working right now. So we can use as well the 3D models to produce uh, you know, so, um, STL files that then we can mill with our CNC machines to uh, produce tactile sort of reproductions of the surface. Um, and that's something we are just doing now. And I'll... Let now Thomas take over and he will discuss his approach to uh, the calibration of the data. Thanks. There we go. Um, thanks very much. That's helpful. I wanted to start by just um, picking out on one of the points that, that you mentioned there, which I think is helpful as context for just um, outlining to you some of the challenges um, that I've been focused on, that, which, which are quite detailed and relate to minimizing um, the error that gets accumulated when you, you do the task that, that has been done here. So as, as Avi alluded to, um, photogrammetry is very effective at producing um, low frequency, high quality 3D models of a surface. Um, whereas photometric stereo um, is, is excellent for very high frequency details and on a pixel wise basis. So if you really want to get, um, you know, uh, an understanding of, of the surface normals with a, of, of, of any surface or any object indeed, um, photometric stereo uh, will give you the same resolution as um, 
the device that you're using to capture that that scene or that that object or that surface. So in the case of the equipment that, that's being used here, clearly they are high grade lenses and high grade sensors. So you're getting you're getting you know very very high quality um, representations of that surface. Um, so photometric stereo, if if you've not come across it before as a, as a technique, you're basically using um, two parameters you know to work out something you don't know. Um, and the two parameters that you know whenever you um, are capturing uh, an, an image, the first is the intensity of the light reflected from a particular pixel or, or particular point, should I say, represented by a pixel in that, in that sense of frame. Um, so if you imagine you've got your, your image, every single one of those pixels has an intensity, a light intensity. And the second thing that you know, because we, we do the calibration, is that the, the angle of the light um, as, as it was being illuminated when it fell and that picture was, was taken or that, that point was captured. So we do know the light position uh, in an X, Y, Z coordinate. And we also know the, um, we also know the, the, the intensity. Um, and assuming you have more than three light positions, and therefore three images, we, we, do, we do 24 at least, um, but assuming you have more than three, you're able to calculate the surface normal um, because, because essentially an inverse of, of the equation that's there, intensity uh, equals quite normal, um, you're, able, you're able to inverse that or invert that, that equation and calculate the normal um, using, uh, well, here, which is typically used, it's the classical sort of photometric stereo approach, which is least square regression. So essentially, you're, you're trying to find the kind of best fit. Um, so that's just a very quick overview of, of photometric stereo, if you've not come across it, but, but that's that's the sort of central process we use. Would you mind flicking the slides up? Because I don't think I have slide yeah. control. <laughs> um, this, this approach has been used extensively with very small objects. I say very small objects. Um, objects that are smaller than the than the than the work that the Canaletto, for example, that that has been photographed here, um, and it's very effective because the the dome of lights that you're using or the the illumination that you're using is far bigger. The capture area is far bigger than the object that you're capturing, um, and what that means is, in the case of a coin here, which is a, a really good example of a high quality um, sort of uh, normal estimation, is that you put that coin in the middle of a dome and then you're much larger so that the lights are um, further from the subject uh, and you're not stitching multiple images together. Essentially, you're just capturing one image and, and you're done. You know, you just then crop, crop it down to, to, to size. Um, uniquely, what's being done here is that we're using, um, with the rig that's, that's been created, we're, we're using a camera that moves. So essentially, you're, you are, you are, you are capturing multiple normal maps and then seeking to stitch those normal maps together. Um, and at face value, that can be done um, straightforwardly using photogrammetry because photogrammetry, by definition, has to estimate the camera position and it does it very well. Uh, estimate the camera position for every photograph, which, which obviously then allows you to switch in the surface normals because the surface normals and the, the captured um, images uh, are a one-to-one -one match. So at face value, it's quite easy. But the problem you encounter is that um, many of the assumptions that underpin that equation I just described, uh, the photometric stereo, namely that, that light is collimated, so it's, it's parallel, um, and that the sensor or the camera or the lens um, doesn't have any, uh, any, any errors. We can, we can um, set parameters exactly and know that those are met. Well, clearly anyone who works in uh, computer vision or robotics knows that these, these parameters, these physical parameters are, are not the case. You know, the light will not always be parallel. The reflection um, will, will clearly um, not always occur, although we can account for that um, in the way you would expect. And, you know, the world is not, does not adhere mathematically um, to, to the formula that we're using. And, and that, the, those assumptions start to break down a, a bit more or the, the, the issues become a bit more clear when you start trying to join normal maps, which is what we're doing here. So you can see um, in the example at the bottom of this slide here, where we've, we've tried to join two normal maps using photogrammetry. Um, and you can see on the left, you've got a slightly darker bluish hue, which would, which would indicate a certain normal direction. And then 
on the on the right hand side you've got a you've got a slightly more red hue which would indicate a very very slightly different normal direction now the difference between those two is probably only a couple of degrees um but because they are on the periphery of the capture area um and because we're then joining the two normal maps it, it becomes a lot more obvious um and if you start trying to turn that into um for example a height map or if you wanted to create a 3d model um, or if you wanted to create a synthetic light position in a, in a sort of a virtual reality context, that difference would actually become more apparent as you shined light because the light would reflect very slightly differently on the left as it would on the right. But in reality, we know that that color is completely flat. So um, essentially, we start seeing errors where previously you wouldn't really see errors if you were just photographing a coin as above because um, it would be incredibly minimal and, and there's no uh, there's no way of it, it becoming obvious. So it's kind of a problem that we've encountered because of the size of the, the works that are being captured here. And um, would you mind moving on to the, the next um, slide? Um, so what, what have we done to solve this problem? Well, we've taken kind of an engineering approach to this because um, it's not possible to, to know exactly the source of all these errors. The way we've tried to approach it is by um, coming up with a with a model that will better fit or will better estimate the normals, particularly when they're in their edge regions. So we essentially apply a kind of weighted, um, a sort of a weighted fix really to 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 the, each of the pixels. Um, so the first step is we we identify features within um, each of the images and we use those features to compute the transformation between the two um, different camera positions. When I say two camera positions, what I really mean is photograph one and photograph two. So Zavi and the team will have moved their rig um, to a new position. Um, and what we do is we work out the transformation from one image into the other. What that allows us to do, particularly where there's a, there's a good region of overlap, which is what we will have, because obviously we needed that for the, for the, for the photogrammetry, that region of overlap allows us to basically view those pixels from two different camera positions. And in doing that, we're basically able to um, correct the, the error that's accumulated. Because obviously, if you've got two data points rather than one for the same pixel, and we know it's the same pixel or the same point, should I say, um, we, we're, we're essentially able to, to apply a correction that will, that will improve the That's the first thing we do. And then the second thing we do, um, which is a typical approach in computer vision, um, which is essentially called flat fielding, which is whereby we we, with the same rig, we will we will take pictures of a completely flat surface, which will allow us to correct for errors in um, the camera intrinsics or, or in the, the lighting rig that are very hard to detect in any other way other than creating a kind of calibration image, really, which, which becomes our flat fielding. So that's the steps that we take. Um, we then apply a correction to the normals that are then produced. And if you if you go into the next slide, that'll be if that's possible. Um, so on the left here, we've got our sort of traditional process um, as was previously done. So you have your images, you produce your normals, you then use photogrammetry to um, kind of join those. And, and as you can see at the bottom on the left there, you do get these, these points of error that become more apparent when you butt the two um, joins up. Essentially the scene looks wrong. Um, and on the right hand side, you've got the same images that have just been put through our process. So we detect the feature points, we work out the, the homography, um, the transformation from one image to the other. That then allows us to match um, points that appear in both, uh, in both normal maps and then correct those based on the fact that we've got these two data sources rather than one. Um, and then additionally applying the flat fielding that I've just described there. Um, and in terms of the error, we, we, we've done some um, sort of calculations on, on what's the kind of mean error from the different approaches. Um, and on the left, um, I won't be in time to plug into a power outlet, so I better do that otherwise I'm going to suddenly vanish. On the left, you've got... Um, uh, on the left, you've, you've got uh, an error of around 10 degrees on the original, which, using our calibration board. And on the right, <coughs> we can get that down to about three degrees um, error in terms of the surface normals. Um, so we do see some improvement. And uh, once you've done this a couple of times, you can essentially start to work out 
the the kind of um, the the weights that need to be applied for the rig as it was set up, which allows you to do this on a on a, on a larger scale. Um, and I think this slide follows with a kind of plain up version that shows the difference. Yeah, so on the left we've got the original, and on the right we've got the adjusted version. Um, and you can see going through the middle of the bar there, um, where we've applied our uh, correction, uh, the seam pretty much uh, should disappear. Um, so yeah, so Zavi, back over to you. Yeah, great, thanks, Thomas. Um, yeah, that was sort of the last slide, just to say um, thank you to uh, all the sort of collaborators and, and, and funders. Um, those are our emails if you want to contact us. And I'll just, uh, I will come out now out of the presentation just to show you the sort of large ortho mosaics that I mentioned before. And I'll share um, um, Chrome, the CFPR website, in a sec. Um, so this is the CFPR website. Um, this is on uh, on the blog that we discussed this uh, kind of letter scanning. Um, and just to show you quickly, uh, you can go down yourselves and, and check for yourselves. Um, but the two images, so we have the color image on, on one side, and that would be in the gray sort of shaded render. Uh, is that's the normal sort of information, but just rendered as a, as a grayscale image. Um, and then that allows us to really sort of zoom in. And you can see it takes a while to load the images because it's kind of a tiled, uh, like Google Maps, when you, you sort of zoom into it, uh, it's just loading individual tiles. Um, but it's just great um, to navigate. Sorry, my cat just got a bit lost. <laughs> um, to navigate the painting and explore it. Um, Yeah, feel free to, to go and check for yourselves. Wonderful. Thank you, Xavi, and thank you, Thomas, for, for giving us an insight and really literally an insight into a commandment of painting and the ways of working through you know, um, the, the challenges that you you face. And I've got the cat here sitting here as well, so uh, luckily he's behaving at the moment. Um, I haven't, there aren't any sort of um, questions in the chat or in the Q&A at the moment, so I'll start you off with one, um, which is basically, what, what was the, the feedback from uh, the Woburn Abbey on the work you were doing? Uh, how was that, how did it help with their restoration possibly? Or I mean, yeah, yeah, with the restoration, it didn't help because we scanned it after the restoration. Um, but yeah, they were very happy with the actual sort of viewer that I just showed. Um, yeah, really interested to actually, they're just renovating their website and the whole, in fact, the whole gallery. Uh, but they mentioned they would be happy to include it in their in their website as well as part of sort of public engagement. Um, I also mentioned about the actual sort of tactile reproductions we're doing now, um, and they seem as well very keen on 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 having those. So I'll, I'll probably send a couple of of reproductions uh, of the surface um, to them. Yeah, so really happy. Um, question. So Lizzie, thank very thankfully, uh, has put in the the link to the scanner uh, in the general chat. So anybody who likes to to experience it themselves. Um, Wonjin's got a question here. So did you find anything unusual in the scanning of the painting, such as areas which have reappeared and repainted or or otherwise modified? Um, there's uh, repainted. No, there was something. Well, yeah, sort of repainted. There was a. Uh, um, a change of mind of the artist uh, in the La Salute, in the church, which is the church on on the left uh, of the of the canal. Uh, there was a slight change on on one of the uh, the the cupolas, I think. Um, I think you can see it actually in the texture image. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, nothing nothing too too major. Um, usually, this this kind of information you would uncover with sort of infrared imaging. Um, so we can only see the surface here. So yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. cool to, 
And then the my, my sort of my pressing question is: uh, what's what's the next stage? And once you've got the the three D mesh, once you've got the three D map um, that you could that you can work with, how how can you see that being worked with in for other functions and purposes? Or has there anything like that been planned to to make? I mean, uh, for for me is is to to provide the data. I mean, the viewer is, is it's a great tool because if you want to actually open those sort of large images on your computer, it's almost impossible with normal laptops. You need a really good sort of RAM and, and, and graphics card. Uh, so having a viewer like that is excellent if you want to check the information. Uh, obviously, you can still check in individual sections if you know a conservator wanted to, to go and open up any different image. Um, I also have the individual sections as uh, what it's called RTI images. So basically you can open each section individually and you can uh, interactively move a light around it to inspect each section. So I have those as well. So that's something very useful for conservation. Um, and then we can export any number of, you know, 3D models, um, data for reproduction, um, yeah, I guess there's lots of possibilities. Probably we haven't sort of got around to do them all, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Wun Jin is also commenting here that there's no surface traces of repainting. Does it point towards more the theory that you use lens in creating its compositions? What's your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I think still, still, I guess I was actually checking the National Gallery website about him, and mm -hmm. and they mention it's. Possibly he used the camera obscura to, to create his compositions, yeah. but yeah, um, it's difficult to know. So uh, you, the, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, you can really see the the actual mm. preparatory lines of the architectural sort of elements. Um, mm. and, and, and that, I don't know if that can indicate that he used some sort of, you know, sort of looking at the yeah. camera obscura image, maybe then going, I don't know. Um, yeah. That's, that's probably more of a you know, art, art historian's point of um, research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is so? What's what's next in the? Because you mentioned that you you this was this this particular bit of research now was funded by the by the Elikre Research Grant. What's next? Is there a follow up to this to this research? Um, yeah, I mean we're planning planning a project to to scan different types of surfaces. Um, one which would involve sort of historic textiles, sort of um, embroideries and, and and tapestries maybe. Um, so we're looking into into that at the moment. Um, and uh, if if funding allows, uh, I have a few other bees that I would like Thomas as well to to participate um, in in working out some some parts that would make um, sort of the workflow a bit more. Uh, easier let's say and in terms of sort of the the, the lighting and and the way we we calibrate the normals mm -hmm. um as i mentioned the software is currently being developed as well to 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 allow for other camera makers to to use the scanner um yeah and at some point it would be great if you know we can have this sort of the scanner as a um sort of a product that we can you know give to a museum say and, and they can use it sort of straight away are there, I can. Are there other sort of applications, maybe where we could, we could scan a surface, or as you said, you make it even scan a texture, uh, or a textile texture, or a fold, or something that could be where it could be used in a virtual sort of environment that you know maybe even for online shopping or something can actually feel the uh, the texture of a cloth or something. Is that yeah, I mean. That yeah, the, the techniques are are very similar than other sort of people in in sort of gaming industry are using. Um, so they use photogrammetry and they use uh, photometric stereo. You know, Adobe has a software that uh, sort of allows you to sort of scan in a sort of uh, tricky way. Sort of it 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 it's able to scan as well sort of textiles and things that they use for sort of virtual virtual environments. Um, but yeah, we can do that. Um, it's mm. exactly gonna, sort of, sort of yeah. going to agree with Avi and say as well. Um, in, in gaming, um, the the amount of uh, demand, the, um, high resolution, high fidelity models uh, is is pretty great. And if you imagine 
the amount of time it would take someone to um, calculate or work out the reflectance of a surface, for example, of a, of a painting, let's say, so that when you're in a game and the, the lighting um, can be moved synthetically to then reflect exactly as it would in the real world, that creates a very immersive experience for the, for the, um, the player. Um, so actually these sorts of tools can allow you to create assets very quickly that um, the real thing um, that will then create very immersive experiences for users in virtual or augmented reality or indeed just you know gaming now and I think the big change is ray tracing so um, you know the big game engines now support almost real time like calculations so uh, you know that's that's a that's a big shift other other areas I think there's an application just for interest is is thing, anything where there's an asset that has to be managed or uh, by a third party and it's very sort of um, you know uh, fine assets so artworks clearly but also in the vehicle industry um, cars are moved uh, around the world and you know they have to be evaluated before and after to make sure uh, in the bodywork and things like that so there are there are industrial applications of this as well mm -hmm. I'm aware of yeah yeah yeah, it'd be interesting to, to see where it all ends, you know, especially with pandemic and being, you know, locked down and not being able to get out of the house or something. And, you know, it, it could well um, change the shopping experience or the experience of, of of interacting with something before, as you say, before you, you commit to either buying or viewing or whatever. Yeah. So that could be a nice yeah. application for and, that. Sort of and thing. how light falls is a key part of that that's, yeah. that's at the moment. You know, it's it's moderate, but but it's accelerating very quickly. The the quality of what's coming mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, it's fascinating. Thank you, thank you for your for the presentation. Uh, is there has anybody anyone got any other questions or? Oh, Abigail has. A, okay, so does an ortho mosaic map allow to distinguish visually between relief and indentations? So the technical question there from Abigail. Um, I don't quite understand the difference. What um, do you mean? You can indentation yourself if you like. I can ask you to um, should bring you into the. I'll add you to the stage, Abigail, and please feel free to ask in person if you unmute your phone or your any camera. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um yeah just so when you see a grayscale image, sometimes it's difficult to decide whether the is there is an indentation, like negative relief or positive. Oh, it does okay. depend sometimes in which way you are looking from the top or from the bottom. So I don't know I if mean, it's clear of how unique is relative it, in our, the structure and the and the auto mosaic map. I mean, if you if you look at the normals, then you know the RGB values, so you can guess when something goes which way. Uh, in 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 grayscale, you're basically looking at uh, a shaded image. So it depends on how you have placed those lights in your 3D environment to render the image. Um, if if you don't know, it can be confusing. Uh, that's 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 why it's so great to actually reproduce things in in physical form because then you you actually see the, the real surface. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, if I look at the image, I know what what I know what's what. But someone might have yeah, a bit of a confusion depending on the shadows, and someone it, it might look even that everything is inverted when actually it's it's yeah it's pointing out it instead of pointing in. Um, yeah, so I guess um, there is not a unique way from going to an automosaic map to a normal map. Can be confusing, right? Um, I mean, you you can convert. Sometimes I do it. I desaturate normal maps, and you get quite a nice image as well. Um, but still, maybe computer. I don't know if Thomas, you have. Uh, I was just. But... I mean, I, I suppose um, is is action of directions really, and there's an assumption that that everything is facing towards the camera because you know, that's that's what's been that's what's been captured. Um, obviously, that wrap around, and we've been doing work looking at three D objects. Um, that gets a little bit more complicated. Um, and one of the things we have been experimenting with is doing depth for normal maps okay, in terms of what you're describing. So taking a normal map, which is obviously just, just light reflected directions, 
uh, and then and then using an algorithm, a rolling ball algorithm, to to essentially start estimating the peaks and troughs in terms of an actual depth value. Well, if you have a calibration point, so we use the calibration board, and you, you can do it quite well, but it's not as effective as photogrammetry for for constructing that. In terms of the other way around, if you had, uh, you know, a, a map, a tile map that was a 3D, you know, a uh, full 3D render, you certainly can estimate the normals from that. But those normals are not going to be as accurate as normals, pure normal maps. So I guess what we're trying to do is sort of merge the two, take the normals from the, the, the photometric and then the, the, the shape from the photogrammetry, if that makes sense. So the answer is... I think. Okay, thank you. But yes, but some caveats. <laughs> I like it. I like the fact that you know the answer is yes, but uh, so thank you for, for that. Uh, lots of um, lots to 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 think about and to talk about. Now we are sort of almost out of time, so just to say thank you to Thomas and Sir Javid for the presentation. Well, well done, everyone. Um, I would like, I'm going to stop the recording in a moment so we can go back to the stage and please feel free to sit around the tables and chat more if you like. Um, Ian says thank you, thank you from Sarah as well. So there's, we can also use the, uh, the buttons on the right hand side to give you some applause. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd just like to finish by saying um, that uh, we, our next two talks are artistic talks, um, one on the 9th of February. Um, by Sarah Rees, who's an alumni from the MA in, of print, in printmaking. And then on the 23rd of February is our very own Angie Butler uh, talking about her recent project as well. So thank you very much uh, for attending. Thank you for uh, again, Javi and Thomas for, for, for sharing their research. And uh, yes, yeah, you all next time again um, online or also in person in W Block and Frenchie. Thanks and good luck. Yeah.